So today we are at the uh, biosensors in Lebanon Chief Microsystems uh, a class. My name is, is Hadar, and I'm the head of the Nanobiotics Laboratory at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And today we're going to begin the second lecture, focuses on lab on a chip. Oops. So lab, we will talk about lab on a chip, and, and this is the second lecture in the uh, in the first part of the course, which talking about the system level, understanding what is biomems. What is a lab on a chip? How you integrate lab on a chip? What kind of components you have inside the lab on a chip? Then we also talk, we will discuss next week, right? Next week on Monday on microfluidics, how you connect the different components of a lab on a chip. And then we're going to dive into the second part of the class, uh, focusing on the molecular level, understanding the physics and the chemistry that's happening there and the um, nanoscale uh, uh, interface between the transducer and the uh, biology or the analytes or molecules, learning how to design and how to fabricate those devices. So what is a lab on a chip? You know, it's a kind of a nice uh, 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 definition, lab on a chip. And what are its parts? So what you can see here is, I think it's a very nice uh, picture uh, of a, a kind of uh, catching the whole idea of lab on a chip. We can see some kind of inlets, connectors, uh, uh, that each one provide a different types of uh, fluid. Here it was done uh, uh, with red dye or blue dye, just to show the concept. And you see many, many, many kind of lines which represents microchannels that connect different areas, different areas on the chip, while each area has its own functionality. And we will learn in this class how to design, engineer these kind of devices, and eventually how to fabricate them. So the goal of the second unit of this second lecture is to understand the function and the structure of Lebanon chip. What are the components uh, Lebanon chip is built of? What are the uh, uh, function of the activity of each one of the components? And we will also analyze some uh, uh, commonly used Lebanon chip devices, some examples from literature. So what is a lab on a chip? What do you think a lab on a chip is? What does it do? I want to see here some, uh, some hands, to see some hands. What do you think a lab on a chip is doing? Can I unmute you? Oh, you prevented me to unmute you. OK. So I will answer it. Lab on a chip is basically any kind of a microsystem that answers two, uh, two main uh, um, components, two main uh, ideas. One, it's a system that is miniaturized, usually, usually into this, uh, to the micro scale, nano scale, uh, smaller than one millimeter size. And the second part is the integration. A lab on a chip is a microsystem that you integrate different functionalities. Second. Sorry. I don't know what is the weather in, uh, in, uh, in Xi'an now, but in Israel it's very hot, then it's very cold. So it's kind of like you go from outside very hot into inside the room, it's very cold with the air condition, so yeah, it's affect us. Don't worry, no COVID. Oops, okay. So we start some history 
of Lebanon chip. We talked about uh, uh, last uh, yesterday about microfabrication, about the semiconductor industry, and the real uh, uh, the real uh, breakthrough that eventually uh, helped to establish the field of a lab on a chip is the idea of moving from electrical component circuits, as I guess some of you have done doing some physical lab or, electric, uh, or, or, or electricity lab, into the invention by Kilby. Kilby that uh, was the head of the group in IBM that established the field of, of um, uh, semiconductor uh, industry, which is the microfabrication or basically going from a multiple components, each one is a resistor and capacitor and so forth into the whole functionality on, uh, on the same microfabricated chip. It's called the integrated circuits. So this is a kind of technology that helps to make this kind of complex circuit into by only microfabrication of different layers, different uh, integrated circuit uh, technology. And we'll talk about it in the last lecture. It enabled integrating multiple semiconductor structures and components on a microelectronic chip. It was done on the same layer and the same uh, 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 at, at, the, at the same fabrication process. And with that, it also helps to miniaturize those kind of structures into the the limit. Of the technology that enabled to do the to do the miniaturization. The thing about it, if you can do like a capacitor or resistor, you know, with this kind of physical uh, dimensions, when you use this technology to make the resistor and the capacitor, you can then make them much smaller. You can go in the micro scale. I mean, the technology that help us to do this kind of resistor, you cannot do this resistor in the micro scale. But with the technology that this do that manufacture resistor in this technology, you can then again make them much, much smaller. But this kind of uh, advancement really established the field of laminar chip, or st specifically established the field of integrated circuits. So we are still not in laminar chip. And then because now we have new technology that enables to do uh, microstructures from different materials on a very small and smooth substrates, very small substrate, people took this technology and started to manufacture new type invented, new type of, uh, uh, of devices that can make, that can be much smaller than the conventional devices. For example, and, uh, um, they were able to make those kind of resistors, piezo resistors, structures in a micro scale that together behave as a pressure sensor. They were able to make those small structures of, uh, of uh, interdigitated uh, uh, structures that later on were able to work as an accelerometer sensor to measure the acceleration. So this kind of technology that Kilby uh, invented was able to now uh, invent new types of devices, uh, a more sub micrometer size mechanical structures, which eventually also enabled the MEMS device. This kind of MEMS devices, the microelectro mechanical systems devices, the MEMS devices, we discussed about it yesterday. So we have no type of sensing MEMS devices. So that was perfectly fine, but back in 1970, there was a new invention, new trial and error. Again, this is all by creativity of trying new things with this kind of technology. And in 1970s, they were developed uh, a new type of uh, uh, technology of, uh, that enables 
fluid handling. Like how you can handle the fluid, you can take the fluid, you can take them the, the fluid in micro scale uh, structures and mix it. So they were invented micro mixers or micro pumps. You can control the flow of the solution in a, in a, um, in a slower, uh, basically a, a flow. You, uh, when you flow the solution in the bottom channel, you can, you can open the, the valve, so uh, flow is flowing. And when you uh, uh, apply pressure at the top, so it closes the, the, um, the lower channel, and you have kind of like a, a, a pump. So you open and you close, you open and you close, and then it allows peristaltic flow of the solution. So with that, you have uh, micro mixers, micro pumps, micro valves. You can use it only for one half of the option, like you have open and then you apply pressure. You close the channel and the lower flow now cannot, you cannot flow it. So these have different types of devices, components that allow to handle the fluid. And now we are entering the late 1980s, the 1990s, basically it's kind of, I guess, of you were born. And over there it began, it's this time it began the, uh, um, the invention of the lab on a chip devices. And why is that? Because so far we saw sensing components and we saw fluid handling devices. Now, if you take the sensing component, integrate it with the fluid handling devices, then it was established uh, devices that have both functionalities that enabled actually to miniaturize the whole functionality of a lab on a chip. Lab, what we've done, so now we look at the lab on a chip the, a definition, a lab on a chip. Uh, just a second, I want to, yeah. And it means that you take the functionality in the lab. Now look at what happens in the lab. People are going, uh, uh, making some solutions, uh, uh, mix them, moving to another area do some kind of analysis, move it to another area and so forth. So we can have, have this kind of solution, a sample that is moving to different locations and in different locations, you have different functionalities. So by integrating those two, oops, two uh, uh, capabilities of fluid handling and sensing, integrating together with this kind of technology. We said the technology enables to integrate multiple devices. We were able to start and, and establishing a new field that you were able to do all the functionalities being done on the lab on a chip. And that came with the name of a lab on a chip. If you remember initially, we said there are two main components for a lab on a chip, is miniaturization and integration. And this kind of capabilities enable, enable the expansion into a new type of application. Uh, uh, we have uh, different types of biochemical assays. Now we can do actually what is done in the lab. So for example, real time PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We talked about it uh, when you want to detect uh, such a, a viruses such as the COVID. Immunoassays, you, you use antibodies to detect different types of molecules. The electrophoresis for detecting cancer cells and bacteria, the electrophoresis, those who don't know, uh, uh, is by applying AC field, electrical field, you can cause the, uh, um, uh, no, the, uh, the polar, the, you can cause uh, uh, a polarity uh, on a, on a non-conducting material. People also use it for chemical applications, 
for separating molecules for mixtures for example if you want to uh, have a, if you have multiple types of uh, molecules and you want to detect a specific uh, type of cell so you can apply uh, um, uh, uh, microfluidics and laboratory devices to separate some of the molecules and leave it with only the analyte that you want. And we're going to show some examples uh, uh, in the microfluidics unit. Chemical reactors, reactors, chemical detection. We talk about generating a drug. So everything can be done in a micro scale instead of a big beakers when you mix everything, different kind of chemicals to synthesize new type of chemicals. You can do everything done on a chip in a very controlled way. And biological applications, such as now taking cells and culturing them uh, uh, into uh, tissue engineering, for example. We saw the uh, yesterday the application of making the retina cells, or even a single cell analysis. And, and there is a very nice application for that. It's called uh, for uh, circulating tumor cells. This is CTC. Circulating is tumor cells. These are tumor for cancer cells. That whenever you have uh, a, um, a tumor in the body, uh, there is some kind of uh, a small portion of cells that are detached for the tumor and start to circulate in the bloodstream. And then they find a new place. And over there, they start to uh, generate a new tumor. Okay, so this is called the metastasis phase of the cancer. We talked about how it's important also to know the uh, biological, biochemical uh, uh, definitions. And over there, this kind of, if we can catch these circulating tumor cells, the cells that are in the bloodstream, we can, uh, first we can uh, prevent potentially prevent some kind of uh, uh, metastasis, uh, the generation of new tumors in the body. But also we can detect what is the type of, if there are any tumors, what is the type of the cancer that, we, that the person have? So this is a single cell analysis. So what is a lab on a chip? We ask this question again, and now we are much more, uh, 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 educated with that, and we know that lab on a chip is have a, a system, microsystems have both miniaturization of components and integration. Now, many, many examples you also will see that it's called with kind of different other names micro total analysis system, microtas. There's a very known uh, conference for that every two years. Point of care devices devices that can be used at the point where the care is given, at the physician office, at home, and, and more. Okay, any, any questions so far? If anyone have a question, please raise their hand. Everything clear? Okay. So we know what is a label chip, and let's try to drill down and see what kind of categories there are of a label chip. So there are many, 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 many types of label chip. You will see basically it's eight different, there are endless examples of lab on a chip. It's basically uh, uh, any kind of a microsystem that you were thinking about uh, to, to invent, to manufacture, to create, to design. But if you can look down and try to, 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 categor to categorize those uh, Lebona chip devices, we can categorize them into the two main uh, uh, functionalities uh, that we also discussed about them yesterday, sensing of sensors and actuators. There's actually a very known uh, uh, scientific journal called Sensors and Actuators. And the sensors are those lab on a chip devices or components that transfer the energy or the, uh, the environment or the biology or the molecules into electrical signals. And actuators are those, again, that translate the opposite direction 
from the electrical signal, sorry, from the, from the electrical signal to the environment itself, right? We gave sensors such as if you want to detect the presence of uh, a COVID virus uh, in the sample, so it's sensors from the environment where the COVID is into electrical signal or an actuator such as a, a, a hard defibrillator or a um, stimulator that you apply electrical signals and it translates into the heart and applying uh, electrical stimulation. Questions on this slide? Anyone? Great. So after we categorize those lab on chip devices, let's try to see how you you can have a configure how you can you can configure what are the components you have in a lab on a chip and how they are connected to each other. So here's a kind of like nice scheme that shows uh, almost all the components that could be in a lab on a chip, but also shows the organization. So see how much it organized. Or configured so you have kind of like the inlet where you input the sample then it goes through different processes see how many processes of sample preparation because you know we take the sample now we need to detect some molecules you have inside but first you need to prepare it so for example there is the filtering you want to filter some big chunks of uh, cells so you have the filtering and then the samples go, uh, no, it's, yeah, it goes to, uh, uh, no, 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 injection mixing. Yeah, it goes and be in, in some other reagents. See, there are some reagents that are already available on the chip itself. They are mixing or they are coming together with the sample and now you need to mix them. So it goes through these structures and you mix the sample, the filtered sample with all the reagents to cause some reactions. See, they're going here. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, you mix them. And then you apply them into here to this kind of serpentine structure. And the separate structure is allows you know to the solution to flow very slowly here, but to cause the reaction. So we put the sample, we add some reagents to interact with them to I don't know to generate uh, some. If you have some enzymes together with the sample, it will in a substrate it will generate some kind of products that will be detected by the sensors. For example, cause them products that change the color. So we need some time for that to happen. Usually it's a couple of minutes. So during that the flow here, we don't want to stop the flow. They are flowing, but they're reacting in between during this time. And then they come here to the sensor readout where they already uh, um, uh, mix and reacted and incubated and the reading is happening. And then what we're gonna do with the sample, it goes to the drain and to the waste. Okay, so we have an input, some kind of preparing the sample, detecting, and output. Does anyone have any questions on this slide? So what are the main building blocks of 11 chip? If you can try to have like a building block, like a diagram box, blocks diagram. So we have the sample input. We have some kind of sample pretreatment components that prepare that preparing the sample before it will be analyzed. We need to uh, 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 kind of a transfer components uh, to move the sample through the pretreatment steps, but also to the sensors. Then there are components that sensing the light, and there is an output signal. And all of that, we have a component 
that uh, uh, controls uh, all the fluids or the micro pumps or the sensors and the, that's the processing that controls the whole system. So it's a very simple, simple input, simple per treatment, it being transferred into sensors and an output signal. So these components, the structure, and you always have to remember the structure when you want to design a lab on a chip, what will be the sample per treatment, what will be the sensors. And we need to uh, get familiar with what kind of components we can use. So we look at the functionality. We analyze the biology. We know, okay, we want to detect specific uh, you know, like the COVID, again, I'm gonna show the example of the COVID every time because I think it's much easier to understand. And we decided we want to take the RNA. So we need to know what is the sample, how we're gonna treat it. We're gonna, do we need to separate some components? What are the functionalities that we need? Do we need some to react, to generate some uh, uh, fluorescent response? And then we have the sensors and the output thing. So we design it, and then we look at the component, what, which component will give us these functionalities. The functionality of separating the RNA from the, from the protein, the functionality of reacting with uh, some byproduct to generate fluorescent response. What are these detectors that you want to use to detect fluorescent response? And these components, there are many, many different types of components, and they're also listed in the literature that I sent you. Uh, but these components can be either passive or active. Passive meaning that you don't need energy to, uh, to cause the component to work. And active are components that you do need to invest some um, energy, some uh, electrical uh, current for them to work. So the bottom, the take home, la the take -home message is that first think about the function of the lab on a chip and from that drill down and decide what will be the components that you want to have. So let's go through this kind of scheme and, and see some example of components that could provide the functionality of the lab chip. The first one is the sample or the input of the sample itself. So in order to know what kind of samples or what how we can input the sample, first we need to know what is a sample, okay? What is the type, the composition? What are the volumes that we can provide? You know, if, if uh, we're talking about uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, taking the swab and, and, and for the uh, testing of the COVID, so we, don't, we cannot provide from the person uh, uh, milliliters or liters of sample, right? So we need to know that we already have very small amount of sample. What is the type? Is it the solution? Is it the, what is the, the uh, uh, rigidity, the, uh, the uh, density of the sample? What is a sample? For example, if you look at biological sample, biofluids, we have the blood, but blood is not enough. Uh, is it a whole blood? Directly the blood that we take from, you know, from our body? Or is it plasma, which is uh, uh, after the blood is being separated, so you have all the cells after being, so after you take the whole blood and you centrifuge, centrifuge it, you get all the cells and all the plasma. Plasma is the solution of the blood. Or maybe you actually need, uh, um, only the proteins in the plasma. And you need to separate the water from the protein in the plasma. So the question of what kind, what is the sample that you really need for that to, to do the analysis? Can you do that in the whole blood? Or you need to do all the steps of removing all these parts. Urine, 
we have the CSF, the uh, uh, liquid in our brain, or the interstitial fluid. What is the sample? Now, sample doesn't have to be biological sample. It could be also uh, samples from the environment. Okay, doesn't have to be. Could be also soil. Doesn't have to be liquid. Could be soil. Something which actually um, I haven't showed here, but right now the kind of the the biological fluid that everyone kind of looking at because it has a lot a lot of information molecular information on the person is facets actually facets it's uh it's uh poop poop actually poop but with poop is kind of the holy grail and it's a kind of it's not exactly solution it's not exactly solid and we need to do some kind of processes to make it solid so uh, uh, poop is it's actually a very uh, used biological fluid, but also in the gas, in, in a gas phase. Maybe the molecules that we want to detect are in the gas phase, and we need to think about how we can transform these molecules from the gas phase into the liquid phase. And also in, the, and also in food. Okay, so we need to know first what is the sample. What do we need to do with the sample? What kind of the type? What is the composition? What are the available volume? Now, when we know what the sample is, let's see what we can, what we need to do, and what how we need to treat it, or how we need to prepare it for the sensor's path. So there are different types of categories or methods to do the for the sample pretreatment. There are the uh, here the listed four different categories: extraction, filtrations, or basically we have a sample and we want to extract a specific or one a specific type of molecules, or you want to filter all the other molecules that you want to measure. Microvalves, you want to uh, um, control the solution, or basically to have a kind of a valve that uh, that stops the solution from flowing. Micro pumps continuously pump the solution, and micro mixer we saw the example before to mix different types of solution, solutions. So this is kind of the threat pre treatment that we can do before we get into the sensors. So the first one, extraction or filtration. There are three main extraction sample extraction methods. We want to extract specific molecule. There's a physical particle filtration. You know, we put a filter. And only specific molecules can go through the filter. Uh, an example is like if we have a filter which is based on size, so only smaller molecules that are smaller than the um, pore size of the filter can go inside, and all the other molecules stay outside. Chromatography, liquid liquid, solid phase extraction, uh, and also diffusion in laminar flow. Uh, we can actually uh, control the uh, we know the molecule has different diffusion coefficients or diffusion rates and you can use this diffusion rate for molecules that diffuse faster than others to extract them here we see some very cool example of the h filter it's called at the um and uh, next monday the next Type is a microvalves. Microvalves, we said that it allows to how we can control the solution to flow from one side to another. And the function of microvalves is to allow the manipulation of fluid by uh, 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 um, only allowing the one direction of the flow. So, an example we have we have two categories of an active and passive valves. Here we have an example of uh, an, a passive valve that you have flow from one direction, sorry, from here to here. And there is kind of movable, movable micro ball inside the channel. So when flow is, is when a solution flows to, from one direction to, to from the right to the left-hand side, 
the ball moves and you can have the flow. But when we have now flow from the left side to the right side, the ball kind of prevents from the flow to come back. The other part, example, is an active microvalves. Remember that we have the pressure, we apply pressure or some uh, electrical current that we have, the, we have the channel here. We have a very, very thin membrane on the top of it. So when we don't apply any pressure, the channel is open. When you apply pressure from the top, the membrane deflects and can now uh, actually uh, prevent from the flow to flow, to, from the solution to flow at the bottom channel. The main type of active, uh, here is kind of the list from the table, from the literature, uh, mechanical uh, operation, uh, the operation methods, mechanical like uh, uh, closing the channel. It, the actuation causing the channel to close, it could be magnetic, electric, piezoelectric, thermal. There are different switching principles. These are the examples of the papers of that you have in the book. Um, could be non-mechanical, okay? You can actually cause microvalves not to actually close the channel, but still cause the solution to flow at one application, one uh, functionality, not, not flowing in another functionality, such as electrochemical, phase change, biological, and can use some external uh, application. This is what's done from externally, and this is a uh, pneumatic, uh, mode of action, membrane, inline, and so forth. Passive microvalves, we don't want to apply any, any, any energy. We have mechanical, non-mechanical. We have capillary valve microvalves. By the capillary of the, of the capillary forces of the solution, and a lot of different other examples that I won't go into it. Um, the last, the second, the third one, third, third, the third component for micro, for sample pretreatment is the micro pumps. Remember, we need to somehow to cause the solution to flow. So there are different types of uh, 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 working principles of micro pumps and we divided into displacement and dynamic. Displacement is that we take a solution and move it each time, move it. Uh, uh, and displacing, placing it in another area each time. So this is kind of displaced micro pumps. And dynamic is that continuously, they flow continuously from one area to another area. So the displacement, and here we can see, uh, uh, um, uh, actually both of them um, are dynamic. So by applying here, by applying charge, you apply, playing electrical field, you can cause some negatively charged uh, 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 molecules to flow from one area to another, causing the flow of the solution, causing the sample to flow from one area to another, or actually by using different types of pressures. When you just put a small drop and a large drop in different areas of, this, of the channel, and that will cause actually different types of pressures, and you have a passive pumping from one area to another. Displacement uh, uh, micro pumps, here are some examples. And you have the dynamic, more like centrifugal. There's also an example of actually the first micro pumps that were done, they were done in a, a centrifugal force. You can look like a compact disc. If you remember, they were like that, those discs. And you put a sample in the middle, you put some channels outside, and you put it inside the compact disc, and it was like circulating and allows the, the fluid to flow from one area to another. Electrosmotic, uh, we're also going to discuss it also later in doing the microplatics. And the third part, the fourth part of the sample pre treatment fun components functionality is the micro mixer. So we have extracting, valving, pumping, and mixing. And here's a very nice example of uh, uh, the flow. The flow in the micro scale, we don't have any turbulence. So we cannot mix the solution. We cannot just take 
uh, uh, if, uh, channel, uh, uh, take a tube, flow the sample, flow two samples and make them a mixing. No, we need to cause the mixing. Because when we have an in, we have two solutions in a very small uh, uh, channel, we have the, the um, uh, laminar, a phenomena called the laminar flow, no turbulence. You see, they can flow continuously without any mixing. So you can add an either magnetic mixing or you can cause these kind of structures and that will have both samples to flow. And because of different pressures, different locations, it will cause some mixing, some micro mixing areas where the uh, sides are that will cause the mixing of the blue and the red solutions. There are active micro mixers. Uh, you apply pressure, you apply uh, magnetic uh, actuation, piezoelectric, thermal, acoustic, and so forth. The more passive. The T or Y mixer, I think this was the T mixer. Injection, chaotic, and so forth. Okay. So we talked about four different types of pretreatment. How we take a sample, we do pretreatment, the extraction of or filtering of a specific molecule, the valving, we want to open and close the channel, micro pumps to uh, allow the sample to flow from one area to another and the micro mixer to mix the samples. Do we have any, do you have any questions on the sample pretreatment options or functionalities? Uh, anyone has any question, please raise your hand. Okay. Okay, so we took a sample, we do, did some pretreatment. Now the sample is ready for the sensing, for the detection, but we need to transfer it somehow. So for that, we can use microfluidic channel networks. Very cool area. Here an example of, of doing multiple, we have, we have one inlet that is bifurcated into uh, uh, two daughter channels and each channel is being divided into other two daughter channels which eventually you can uh, uh, <coughs> take, this, take the sample and divide it to a lot of uh, uh, very small other uh, samples, samples that, can that can be used for the analysis. Um, We have different types of ways to guide the liquid in the channel. We can use pressure-driven flow, capillary flow, segmented flow, electro-wetting, uh, or dielectric, or electrokinetic. So how we can actually transfer the solution from one area to another. And this is an example of the electro uh, kinetics, how we can have physical phenomena of electrokinetics movie, movement. And here we have two electrodes, anode, anode and cathode, that they are, they are present in different uh, potentials. They apply a potential difference when, and you have, when you have two electrodes that are in potential difference, it's kind of like a capacitor but it has, uh, <clears throat> um, it causes two molecules that are uh, uh, negative charge to flow into the positively charged to the anode electrode and molecules that are positive charge to flow towards the cathode. And that's what we see here. We see that ions of varying, uh, 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 of, that are negative charge, but has different charges, the, the different uh, charge to mass ratios those that are more charged can flow, move faster to the anode and so also for the positively charge. So we have kind of like electrokinetic, electrokinetic phenomena that uh, due to electrical field electro, you have movement of ions. So this is another way how you can transfer your sample, which are the molecules into different locations. 
can, also, can have also centrifugal microfluidics. This is the example I told you about um, the disk idea of you actually was beginning with taking a, a compact disk, disk, like for listening for music. They're making different types of uh, channels on top of it. And you put the sample here, you put it in the micro disk or the centrifugal centrifuge. It being centrifuge, being circular, it being moving. And due to the, due to the uh, um, centrifugal uh, uh, force, the solution flows from this area to this area. And here is done through different mixing, different um, uh, structures into the detector. Okay, so does anyone have any questions on the sample transfer part? Okay. So we took the sample, we did some treatment, we transferred it into another location on the chip, on the lab on the chip, and now we need to do some kind of detecting with sensors. And sensing, I'm going back to the scheme that I showed you uh, yesterday, and I'm going to continue. And they are repeated multiple times because it's very important to understand what are the components of a sensor. And the sensor has, if we have the molecule that you want to detect that was moved uh, from the, pre, the sample pretreatment, the sensor part is made of three parts. We have the uh, receptor part that enables the, the selectivity of the sensor to the specific molecule. We have the physical chemical transducer, the part that translate the uh, uh, recognition uh, uh, event when these molecules integrate, integrate, uh, interacts with the receptor, it translates this kind of this kind of uh, um, recognition event into an output signal. So we have three components, the physical chemical transducer, the receptor, and the, signal, the output signal. Now there are different types of, sample, of sensing, or, and, and they are based on the type of the physical chemical transducer. We have electrochemical transducers, and over there we have uh, different types of uh, different subtypes of electrochemical transducers, such as perometry, impedance, potentiometry, voltammetry. And we're going to discuss it more next week on the lecture of, of electrochemistry. We focus specifically on electrochemical sensors. We have gravim gravimetric uh, uh, principles of sensing, such as surface acoustic wave sensors, quartz crystal microbalance sensors, more like piezoelectric, optical sensing, any optical such as fluorescence, absorbance, uh, luminescence, interferometry, and colorimetry, colors. And we have the last part, which is electrical sensors that measure uh, uh, electrical components such as resistance, capacitance, and inductance. And the, and the difference between electrical and electrochemical is that the cause for the, for the electrical component change, like here you also measure current or resistance or impedance, but the, these changes in the signal cause because of chemical molecules that donate the electrons that cause the current. Here, the, the cause for the change in the electrical signal uh, uh, components characteristics is because of, the, of uh, some molecules that cause change in the, uh, uh, um, the behavior of the electrical component itself. So there are no charge transfers, there are no electrons transferring between the chemical molecule and the sensor. In electrical, that the chemical you do have. Any questions on the uh, sensors part? Uh, 
fantastic. Let's see some case studies for lab on a chip, some examples. Case study one, a point of care platform for quantifying active enzymes. So here we see a lab on a chip that has the different components we discussed about. Remember, I can make again to the components, the pretreatment, sensors, output signal. And here we have a, a paper based device, a device made of paper that with different types of materials on top of the paper, it allows quantifying an enzyme, an active enzyme analytes. Okay. So it allows uh, uh, um, measuring um, yes, allows measuring uh, um, the presence of, an, of enzymes. And for that, uh, we have a sample. So we need first we need to know what is a sample. The sample is some kind of solution that has enzymes inside. Now we don't know how much enzyme there are. We know what are the enzymes. We know uh, that they are present in the sample, but we don't know how much enzyme we have. And this is, again, we need to know what is a sample, what we want to function, what we want to read from that. So this is um, it's samples. And the sample itself is being added here. This is a side view of the uh, device, the inlet. Now there are different parts uh, of the device itself going from top to bottom. Okay, and uh, eventually we have the assay region or the control region it's flow through different filters. You can see that the, the first part is buffer containing magnesium uh, chloride. Um, and it's adding some other cofactors. Then we have some enzyme substrates. So think about it's kind of like a sample transfer. It goes some time, it moves. Here, you add the cofactors and it's still going diffusing very slowly down, 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 down to the S region. But here, it, 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 um, uh, the sample meets the enzyme substrate. Remember, we have an enzyme. We need some substrate for that to react. So we introduce the substrate. We allow it to some kind of to do the reaction. And here, uh, we have uh, uh, the readout of the sensor. Uh, where are the sensing, uh, the sensing uh, go going to happen? So it doesn't have to be laminar, it could be also vertical. Sample is coming, uh, uh, um, introducing to different buffers, different substrates. Eventually there's kind of reaction here, comes here and here being read to see how much product was generated and this product amount is related to how much enzyme you had in the beginning. Questions about this slide? Okay. Uh, we're gonna, I think we're gonna go from this one or no, I think it's also good. So we have case study two, a point of care a uh, uh, system for genomic diagnostics. If you want uh, to analyze what is the, if we have any presence of any mutations in genes, so can be done, we could do that uh, fast at the point of care. Yeah, it's a microfluidic biomolecular amplification reader, the micro from the micro bar, they call it the micro bar. There is a microfluidic uh, 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 reaction chamber so you remember again, we have the inlet. What is the sample is blood. What exactly in the blood we want to measure is uh, some DNA because we want to have the genome detection. So for that, we need to somehow generate the DNA from the blood itself. And for that, we have the sample preparation, sample pretreatment steps. We have the, uh, uh, the samples inlet, and it goes through a series of channels, a series of chambers, 
when there are different types of reactions to prepare the sample that will go into the micro bar. And over there we have, after we did the pretreatment, now we didn't need to do the sensing. We have blue LEDs, a waveguide that reads the levels of the reactions or level of the color change, or maybe the, also the absorbance directly uh, from the end chamber after all the reaction chambers. So we have sample input, pretreatment steps, comes to the detector, to the blue LEDs. It's in the bottom side. They do the sensing. It's, a, it's an optical sensor, measure the absorbance. And from that, you know how much uh, uh, DNA, specific DNA you had in the beginning. Any questions on this slide? Okay. Case study number three, a microfluidic analyzer for measurements in marine water. So it's a bit bigger than what we always uh, what we saw so far, but still it's uh, about 25, uh, 22 centimeter size, but the actual microfluidic chip is 25 millimeter size. Um, and the goal here is to uh, uh, detect soluble reactive phosphorus in seawater. Now this, I brought this example that we don't really need always to measure uh, biological fluids. Here, the sample is seawater. Seawater, and we need from the seawater to detect the SRP, soluble reactive phosphorus. It's a, a toxic material. And for that, we have the sample, the input, and we want to have uh, uh, um, some kind of uh, reactions, the pretreatment that eventually goes into the sensor for the detector. So we can see this, the, how the chip looks like. It has different reagents, okay? It has the uh, LEDs for the detectors, the uh, uh, you put a sample here, here you put uh, some other standards and black measurements. So we always have when we do the sample, we also need some uh, uh, standards, one and two, to see. Standards mean that you have the SRP, that you introduce the SRP to see that the chip is working. And to standardize, to calibrate the sensors, you have some blank which is the negative control, some just only seawater without SRPs, all of that being red, and the sample itself, doing the different uh, mixing and all the analysis and eventually being red. So again, you see the sample inlet, sample pretreatment, sensors, and output signal. Case study number four, electronic skin for alcohol detection. And here, uh, it's actually a nice uh, um, uh, example that, uh, as, as probably you know, um, drinking and driving, it's very dangerous. It's one of the major reasons for uh, death uh, 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 in, the, in the US, I guess, also around the world. And about in, um, it was uh, about um, eight years ago, the NIH, National Institute of Health, it's uh, the federal uh, organization in the United States for health uh, uh, studies. They offered kind of like, uh, like um, they offered a prize for the first one that's gonna show or gonna invent a device that can detect alcohol, that can rapidly detect alcohol from the person. Uh, uh, and that was done and was not directly from the skin. So this, this group, uh, a group of uh, Joseph Wang from UC San Diego, they uh, developed a patch sensor to detect alcohol or the byproduct of alcohol uh, in the skin on the, uh, on the sweat, which was ethanol. So the device, 
uh, has two different components. It has, again, the sample itself is the sweat. Okay, the sweat has the presence of the ethanol because we drink alcohol, it's being metabolized in the blood. And then from the blood, it moves to the interstitial fluid and into the sweat. So we have sweat is the biological fluid and, the, and inside we have the ethanol that we need to measure. But first, if this is the input sample, we need somehow to cause the sample to go from the, um, from the skin to the device, to the sensor. And the problem here is that every one of us sweats differently. The sweat rate is different. Some sweat fast, some sweat slow. So the amount of sweat is different. So we need to generate some way to, uh, a way to generate higher amount of sweat. And for that comes the iontophoresis. It's a method that you apply. You have two electrodes. Both are the blue high here. And you apply a very, very low current between the two electrodes that causes, I don't feel it, it causes the pores, the sweat pores to open and sweat is coming out. Okay, so it allows sweating in the area of the detector and then it was done for five minutes and then the sample comes, there's some kind of reaction here and it's being detected with those three electrodes with electrochemical sensor. And then it tells you there's current, then the person, there is some ethanol and the person obviously there's some level that is drunk or not. And they, this is again, we, sh we see the, the chip how it looks like. It has, it's a patch sensor. Uh, they printed uh, the electrodes, silver electrodes to do the antiphoresis. And those one, two, three electrodes was used for the electrochemical sensor. Uh, here's the antiphoresis, you apply a current, potential change between the two electrodes and cause the uh, pores to open. And then there is the sensor. Uh, I go on, won't go into too much details. We're going to go because we're going to study about electrochemical sensors later. But the ethanol is being catalyzed by, the, by an enzyme generating hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide can now interact on the surface of an electrode generating electrons. So whenever we're going to have ethanol, we're going to have hydrogen peroxide and current will be generated. Now, this big thing is the electronics. It's actually very nice. You can use Arduino or uh, Raspberry Pi. There's actually very nice online workshops not right now. Um, maybe I can send you later uh, the uh, link to the workshop if anyone wants to develop some kind of Arduino circuits there very nicely. Uh, they you can order any types of off-the-shelf components and make your own board. And here was done, the board was reading the current and sending that wirelessly to the computer. And they did a nice uh, video about it. Here's the patch, they put it on a student. They move, put the, um, uh, the electronic chip uh, to measure the current. The person, student, very lucky student was drinking uh, alcohol. You apply the antiphoresis to generate a sweat and then it wirelessly send information to computer and this kind of increasing uh, plot means that you have more and more current, meaning that this is the alcohol that is being measured. Very cool. Okay, any questions about uh, the last three slides, this example, or the previous example? Yes, we have a question. Ah, you only doing like this? Okay. You have a question there, students in the beginning, in the... Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Case study number five. We actually have a lab on a chip at the Bengal University. This is an example that's done in my, in my group. 
And here the, again, the example, we, I'm giving you examples and we need to exercise on breaking down the components, remember? So here's another example. And here uh, uh, there is the need for this therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, and an example for that is the uh, schizophrenia patients. So schizophrenia patients are being treated with a very good, a very good, very efficient medication, uh, antipsychotic medication called uh, clozapine. They actually about more than 20% of patients in China actually are being treated with this uh, medication, uh, patients for schizophrenia. It's a mental disorder. And, but the problem is that this medication is very, very effective, but, but has some side effects. So it requires weekly monitoring the levels of the medication that is not being done. So a lot of patients, are suffering from the uh, un non optimized and uh, suboptimal levels of the drug. They, they, they take too much drug, they take too, much, too less drug. So they don't have the optimal levels because we don't measure the levels of the drug in the blood. So here, this, uh, we came up with this kind of uh, uh, need. Uh, uh, with the goal to develop a point of care testing device to measure the levels of the drug, but also to measure, sorry, to also to measure the levels of another side effect was that the white blood cells levels will decrease. So you want to measure the levels of the drug in the blood and also the levels of the white blood cells. You see that they are not decreasing. So this is a scheme of the lab on a chip that we came up. First, you design the lab on a chip for different functionalities. So the first thing we look is what is the sample? And the sample is blood, whole blood. And from that, we need to know two, uh, uh, two answers. One is what is the levels of the drug? And two, what are the levels of the white blood cells? So basically, we can have, we have kind of like lab, two lab on a chip integrated together, two sensors together. So see what, let's see what happens. So because we want to detect the drug itself, and we need to remove all the, if you remember, the, we have the whole blood, we have the plasma. So we want to detect uh, uh, the, the drug in the plasma solution. And we want to take this. We want to take the whole the white blood cells in the cell portion. Remember, you have the plasma and the cells. So the first part is that we need to take the whole blood and separate it to plasma and to um, the cells. And this part of it is the plasma skimming. And this is this the how it works. It has a longer channel here, a bigger channel, and a very small channels with small diameters going perpendicular to that. So what happens is that the cells, the, the whole blood comes here, the big cells continue to flow in the, in the bigger channel and the plasma or the fluid goes to here. So we have kind of like separation. Remember the pre 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 sample pretreatment, we had the separation of cells from the plasma. And now we can take the plasma to the reaction chamber, and here uh, uh, the drug is electrochemically active, so we can detect uh, uh, um, uh, detect, the, detect the drug on the electrodes from a three electrode cell. And now we need to detect the white blood cell, and for that it flows. The cells are flowing here. Now we have both blood red blood cells and white blood cells. And we need to detect only the white blood cells. So how can we get rid of the red blood cells? So for that, there is a very nice phenomena that actually the white blood cells has a much thicker membrane. Again, know your biology. And the red, because of a, a much thicker membrane, uh, 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 they are more resistant to osmotic force 
to water, you know, osmotic force is when water go inside from a low concentration into high concentration. So they go inside the cells. So what happens here? We introduce the ionized water, water, we cause osmotic force to the cells here. Here we have the serpentine. So there's some kind of reaction. So what happens is that we have the water will go inside the white blood cells and the red blood cells, but the red blood cells are more susceptible. They have a thinner membrane, so they will explode. We have a lysis of the red blood cells. And the white blood cells will survive the osmotic force, the water. And here in the outlet, we're going to have white blood cells and some remaining of the explode red blood cells. And now the last part is detecting the white blood cells. And here the sensors they were all the pre-treatment steps for the, to getting the white blood cells. And here, this is an impedance cytometry. You have two electrodes. I'm just gonna show it. Oh, sorry, this is, I gonna, we have two electrodes and you're gonna measure the signal from the, uh, from the white blood cell, the flow on top of it. I'm gonna show you a second uh, how it works. But if you look again, the out the uh, uh, bigger bigger picture, we have a Lebana chip with a sample inlet, different components of pre sample pretreatment. We have the separation, we have the red blood cells lysis and the white blood cell detection, and the, the drug detection. How are we detecting? The whole blood, the white blood cells. Current approaches are, are based on uh, taking the cells, connecting some uh, fluorescent labels, and uh, reading the fluorescence from the cells. This is called float cytometry uh, um, detectors. But we want to do that on the chip itself. We want to do that here. So we cannot introduce, we don't want to introduce some labels, fluorescent labels and detectors because it's very expensive and we cannot do that at the point of care. So what we have done is doing that on a chip and how, this is how it works. This is an, a bigger image of the detector. We have pairs of electrodes here. Samples are moving and what happens when you have uh, uh, um, two electrodes and something is moving on top of it we have something called the Coulter principle Coulter principle is that you apply two electrodes at a specific potential and when you have something some kind of uh, um, uh, some kind of a structure going through those electrodes, it changes the impedance, the potential. They actually have higher resistance between those two electrodes. You see, higher resistance, the resistance increases, the impedance increases. So this is the com this is the principle that we use for the white blood cell detection. So cells are flowing on top of pairs of electrodes, and whenever they go on top of it. The flow here, the impedance changes between the electrodes. And we have four of these here. You can see how you can measure changing the impedance when they flow here. And then there's changing impedance when they flow here. And the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one going to the waste. Now, the, the last part is how you can cause, if you have a lot of cells together, you want to cause them to go in one line. And for that, we use the focusing flows. Um, this is a real image of how it looks at the chip. You have the sample here. Sample goes, the red one goes here on top of the pair of electrodes. And we have two, out, two uh, side channels that causing the, the focusing. It's kind of like a focusing aperture causing from a thick, from a thick uh, flow into a very thin flow. 
from those two uh, uh, water focusing uh, inlets. So we have a very thin flow of the cells. They are flowing one by one. And we can detect the signal tells us, okay, if we have one cell or not, and not a bunch of multiple cells. This is how the impedance measurements looks like. It's an impedance measuring over time. So you measure the impedance, the cell is flowing, 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 and then you have, it flows through here and you have an increase with the impedance going down. I'm oh, sorry, back on, going down, 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 up, there is an increase going down, increase going down. You see, uh, uh, this is the back on, you have a very low signal and those, all those increases in the impedance, meaning that something flow on top of the electrodes. And, the, and what you can see here, that there are different values of impedance. There's lower impedance increase, medium impedance increase, and a high impedance increase. And that's because the low one was because we have two types of beads or like a, a spherical structures that flowing on top of the electrode, the smaller, sorry, the smaller beads, which are three micron, when they flow on top of the electrode, they have a lower effect on the impedance. But when the five micron beads, which are the bigger, we have higher effect on the impedance. So we can see first if something is flowing on top of the electrode, and also from the impedance size change, we can know it's if it's three micron or five micron. And you also saw some intermediate function was uh, because true three, sorry, two of uh, beads connecting together, the three micron beads, causing much higher impedance. So this is the, all the analysis that allows to detect the white blood cells with a label free, without the need to integrate labels, present labels uh, uh, from the sample itself. This is the example of when we flow red blood cells and white blood cells. Together in the channel, we measure the impedance increase, okay? And we count how many uh, increases could be, and we plot it here. This is the count as a function of the radius of the, uh, of the bead of the cell that we measured. And we can see that most of the, most of the increase, most of the counts were due to white blood cells and not red blood cells. Although we, we introduce both red and red, white blood cells to the chip. And that's because the red blood cells were realized in the uh, serpentine-like structure and only the white blood cells were measured. Okay, any questions about this last case uh, study? Okay, so in the last 15 minutes, I would like to talk about a new and promising area called Internet of Things for lab on chip. IoT, those that don't know what Internet of Things here is, is a very nice example that actually began uh, about a uh, 20 years ago when uh, there is this company called Spark. And what they did, is uh, they connected multiple sensors. They connected sensor on cows, sensors that measure their temperature. Now, the sensors continuously monitor the temperature of the cow. And whenever there is some uh, uh, change in temperature, temperature increases in one of the cows, it automatically connected you know, to the wirelessly connected to the cloud, to the internet and the internet sees, okay, this one has an increase in temperature. It automatically sends an alert to the farmer that we have yeah. some change of uh, temperature. Yeah. 
Sorry about that. So this is the Internet of Things. It's called, they call it the Internet of Cows, kind of like a joke. But the idea is multiple sensors that are connected to the internet, continuously measuring uh, uh, parameters on the environment. And whenever the continuously being analyzed in the internet, in the cloud, and whenever we see a specific pattern, specific change, it automatically decides and does the effect. Second, sorry. Okay, sorry about it. So um, it's been used for different applications, also for uh, geriatric uh, monitoring, for environmental monitoring, food monitoring. You saw the medical and also smart cities. And the first generation of this kind of sensors was, uh, for example, measuring heartbeat, measuring physiological uh, responses such as heartbeat, you know, the Fitbit and the armor, uh, EKG, oh, but also temperature, you know, in, this, in the sea. A very nice example was the Proteus Digital Health. It's a small, a small a pill that the person takes with a sensor that is digestible, that whenever being digested in our stomach, it automatically sends the pulse outside and tells, this, tells the person or the physician that the medication was digested, kind of to monitor people that are taking their medication. But all those kind of sensors that are provide that provide information about the person or about the environment continuously measuring the person. And from that you can understand more about the situation of each person and not about, you know, uh, have more personalized uh, understanding about the physical status of the person that will, uh, that will enable personalized reactions to directly, you know, what are the current situation and you can directly know what, how to uh, address it. Now imagine yourself, you know, if all those kind of, you have physical uh, uh, sensors measuring um, a physiological, so measuring temperature, measuring heartbeat, AKG, Better for yourself if you can have these kind of sensors that continuously measure molecular markers, molecules, not physiological. So there are some examples for that in the environment, sorry. There is the egg quality egg, it measures CO and NO2 in the environment. But if we can have measuring so these kind of molecules, the environment, such as pathogenic bacteria or environmental effects, molecules that we saw until now that can be measured such as white blood cells or medications continuously in the body, on the body and are connected together on the cloud through the internet of things, we can have a more personalized health monitoring or health risk assessment on our uh, environment, on ourselves. But there are many challenges right now and this is the future and this, is, this kind of challenge is about up to you guys, up to you, the students, to try and find uh, um, uh, solutions such as environmental effects. You know, um, there, it, when each one is measuring, if I'm measuring on, on myself and you're measuring there on yourself in China, there are some different effects of the temperature, humidity can cause changes, uh, since effect on the sensitivity and, and the st stability and the reproducibility of the sensors, how you have storage, transfer, and activate them, and so forth. And eventually, of course, the sample type and the pre-treatment step that we all learned about it until now. So if you want, this is a very exciting area. Uh, if you want to really contribute in the future, I suggest going to this area uh, also, and of course, we are doing that in our lab, so you're welcome to join. So let's summarize um, some adventures and disadvantages of these lab on a chip microsystems, uh, how we can do multiple functionalities on a chip. Um, advantages, 
they have a higher spatial resolution. We can do a, a lot of functionalities in a very small area, do it automatically. We don't need a person now to go and move the sample in the lab and do the analysis, everything done automatically. Uh, robustness, user-friendly interface, you know, everything is automatically, so you just can do that, uh, you know, we have a screen, every person can do that at home. Portability and dis disposability, the cost is very low, so you can just do multiple chips and, you know, do, the, you do, do them one time use and dispose them. And portability, everything miniaturized, you can do that at home. And of course, this technology is only in, only at the beginning, and you, you can see how we can invent new types of technology each time opportunities. The disadvantage part is novelty. So each time we need to uh, invent new type of devices. There are effects when you go to the micro scale. There are much higher uh, effects or my, much higher much much higher uh, 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 effect of physical and chemical reactions, the micro scale. The signal to noise ratio, we have a very low signal to noise. So we need a way to increase the signal. Accuracy and precision, but all those kind of things are currently being researched. And this is the challenges mentioned that we are all working, trying to uh, overcome, to provide new solutions. So we have about, five minutes to the end of the class. <clears throat> and um, I want to show something which is not so decent future. So those that don't know, this is the tricorder. Tricorder, this is, was uh, an example, was kind of like a fictionary uh, device in uh, um, uh, kind of an old uh, uh, TV show called the Star, Star Trek. And the tricorder, sorry, the tricorder, it was, you know, in a fiction, in a, in a science fiction, in a fictionary uh, TV show, the medic was coming, had this kind of uh, device at the hand, and it was like reading the medical, like taking a very external thing. And just by moving through the person, it could know, okay, the person is ill, what does it has, and so forth. So it's kind of like a medical diagnostic device fictionary that can do all the analysis directly that from the person. But it wasn't available. So there is this, uh, um, uh, there was a, a challenge uh, about uh, 10 years ago that offered 10 millions of $10 million for anyone, any group that will come and will uh, uh, um, uh, show that they invent a device then a device that can do diagnosis, capture information from the person and do the analysis directly from that without touching the person. And this is, was, uh, 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 was done by XPRIZE, the Qualcomm Tricorder. You are welcome to go into this link, see who won. But it was a very challenging and, and, and eventually three groups came to the final, uh, final uh, line that were able to show the feasibility of such a device that they were invented and do the measurement that they uh, wanted to, do, to be. So it's very challenging and it's possible and it shows how lab on a chip, how we can bring the lab analysis into the chip. Very cool. I won't ruin. I, I, tell, I, I suggest everyone to go to this link. I will send the slides later and see who won. Very cool, very interesting. So with that, I'm finishing lecture number two. Uh, the goal, which focused on lab on a chip, the goal was to understand what is a lab on a chip? Uh, what is the structure configuration? What defines lab on a chip? What kind of categories of lab on chip we have? The components, uh, uh, pre-treatment steps, the sensors, what uh, uh, you, and, and I want to show you as much as I can some examples 
four commonly used lab analytic devices, try to drill, to break them down into what is a sample, how it's being treated, and what are the sensors and what are the output signal. And experiencing, this is the only thing, and I encourage everyone to look at lab on a chip and break it down because I, and this is going to be, um, I, I th don't think we talked about it, but I think uh, the, we don't have an exam at the end of the class. We have a project, right? Is Weber there? Did uh, he talk to you about the uh, final project? Yes, no? Hi. 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 Yeah, I just yeah, give. I think you need to to turn off the speaker on your laptop. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, the students, uh, they give you a sum to agree the projects, final projects. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So in the final project, you will need to, to think about the laminar chip and to do this kind of drill down. So think about what is the sample, what are the pre-treatment steps, what is the sensor, use this kind of block diagram to show what are the components of the laminar chip. And that's why we start from the high of view and then we go drill down and, and understand the physics. But this is the first part for you guys in your project to show the block diagram of how the lab on a chip is built. What are the parts of it? So yeah, exactly kind of the summary. What are the components of a lab on a chip? What are the components that do the sample input, the sample pretreatment, transfers, sensors? What is the output signal? All those kind of things need to be described um, and I think I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna finish here. And next lecture on, on Monday will be about microfluidics, how you connect the different components and how we can use microfluidics for your purpose, for the functionality of the component. And uh, that's it.